speaker right now. I'll go ahead and mute my phone. Uh, my name is Jim Jansen. We're also be joined by Alan Vanalek today. I'm sure many of you that are listening in have either seen us in person or some of our other webinars that we put on together. As always, this program will be archived at the Center for Ag Profitability website link that's noted up on the top center. It's cap.unl.edu slash land management. So you can actually go out there and download like a PDF of the, the slide set that you see today, in addition to um, watching the recording again, if you'd like. Uh, my contact information is on the left-hand side of the slide here. You'll note on the real estate, uh, cap.unl.edu slash real estate, it's where all the current uh, real estate information, the most recent publications can be found. And Alan Benalix is on the right with his uh, different types of succession uh, related topics and educational resources. Alan, would you like to say anything? Yeah, all I was gonna say was, uh, I think we need to apologize. We're sincerely sorry about it, not being able to do this yesterday. Uh, we had technical difficulties that were kind of somewhat out of our control. But it's just kind of, you know, it just kind of goes in the category of something bad can happen, it does. And so there you go. And we're glad to be hosted. We're glad to be on today. And, and thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. With that, we'll go ahead and get started. And as I said before, these slides will be posted online at the website noted on the top center right here. And I believe uh, Ryan will send a follow-up email once this has been posted. Uh, something new that we've been doing, we have local agribusinesses that help us out with our annual farm real estate survey mailing costs. Uh, today's sponsor is Hertz Farm Management. They have locations throughout Nebraska. The team out of Norfolk with uh, Scott Arns, David Creer, and Jason are the uh, farm managers. And I know Jason's a new member of their team. He works on the real estate sales. And Scott and David work on the land management side. So their contact information, phone number to their office is on the bottom center of the slide here. If you'd like to reach out to them, please give them a call. Uh, they do good work and we appreciate uh, them providing us with assistance. The cost of conducting our survey continues to grow and it's good to have industry sponsors are willing to help us out with that. So please remember Hertz Farm and Ranch Management. Their phone number is listed below. Scott and David are farm managers and Jason works on real estate sales, but they all can answer different uh, questions and provide insight on topics that uh, might be a little bit different insight than what I can. So please reach out and find information if you need it. So our outline today, and I guess this should actually be August 16th, but we were supposed to do this presentation yesterday. The outline of topics that we have here today, we'll be taking a brief, re brief review of the 2022 Nebraska Farm Real Estate Survey results on land values and cash rents and also taking a little bit of a dive into what we call the flexible cropland leases. We actually asked several questions on flexible cropland leases related a little bit more to their design. So we'll take a look at what you need to know there. Uh, Alan, it's this time of the year, he'll be taking a look at uh, how do we handle verbal lease arrangements, primarily how do we terminate them if that's something that you'd like to do. Uh, there's a deadline coming up with it. and. Uh, Crop progress. This year has been pretty wild with respect to the weather patterns and the rainfall. Um, here in Northeast Nebraska, we finally picked up some rain yesterday, but we're still in probably some of the worst drought that we have in the state. So it just depends where you're at. So how do you communicate those things? And then finally, we have a couple of questions uh, related to uh, verbal leases. Some of the things you need to know there, but we had some questions submitted and we'll go ahead and run through them as well. So first part here, I'll take about roughly 15 minutes and go over some of the insight that can be provided. Alan will be taking the second half and then together we'll be tag teaming the questions. If you do have questions, you have two options. First option is you can type uh, anything into the chat that you'd like for a question. I'll keep an eye on that. And also there's a question and answer uh, feature to Zoom that you can also type it in. And if you keep an eye on the chat, Ryan usually types in the website link that you need to know for some, something, and that something would be where can you find our historic programs from Ag Land Management Quarter, really, where can you find the archive? So Ryan, if you have a minute, if you could post that to the chat, that'd be great. All right, so first part here, where do you find real estate information? This is somewhat of a boilerplate slide. You 
see me talk on this, I use this many times throughout the year. What we do annually since 1978, we survey the people that work in the land industry. So appraisers, bankers, people that work in farm management, and other related land industry professionals. Based on their survey results, we do two different things. In March of each year, we do what is called the preliminary estimates. That gives some insight on current uh, land values and cash rental rates. And then the final report is published in June, and that's what recently came out. It was on the last day in June, but it did come out. And uh, inside that report, we have much additional detail beyond land values and cash rents, things like what percent of land sales in Nebraska are going to investors versus farmers or whoever. And also you can find a lot of historic information in the back end of the real estate report if that's something you'd like to view. Basics on how we divide the state up. There are 93 counties in the state of Nebraska. We have a roughly 45 million acres of agricultural ground. We take the state, what we've done and what I would foresee into the future, take the state of Nebraska and we subdivide it into eight different regions. We call these regions the agricultural statistic districts, or they're more commonly called uh, crop reporting districts, if you ever have seen that expression before. So based on that, uh, what we do, so if, an example here in, uh, North, in eastern Nebraska, for example, with uh, Lancaster County, where we're broadcasting out of today, here in Lancaster County, that is in what we call the East District. Now, you'll notice there are certain areas of the state that are kind of right on the border with the southeast, and maybe, for example, southern Lancaster County might follow the trends of the southeast more so than the east. But... Um, as I said, these lines aren't perfectly drawn, but they are commonly used by folks at the USDA as well as industry, and it's something that we plan to move forward with in the future. Uh, just a brief overview, and I actually did a presentation uh, a few weeks ago now, I guess, on the current state of land values in Nebraska. The thing to note is the land value of, of cropland, grazing land, all the different types of land, if you came up with an average, what that average is called is the Nebraska all land ag land value. And you can see it right here in the blue line. And the other thing is people keep asking me, where do I think land values are going? First thing is where's profitability headed for farms and ranches across the state. And I just use the price of corn. Corn is the only crop that's grown in every county in the state. Yes, soybeans, wheat, whatever else might be raised across the state is important. But uh, being that we are the corn huskers, I use the value of corn. And you kind of see this pattern. Last time we think seen some similar things to what's happening now with uh, you know, the economy not doing quite as well, they lowered interest rates, higher prices for corn, uh, livestock, soybeans, whatever. Land value set the first high. Now these prices are not adjusted for inflation, but the most recent price that we set followed by some of the highest prices we've seen recently again, uh, we set the highest non-inflation adjusted price of land in Nebraska. And based on some of the things I'm seeing in this late summer time period or mid to late summer time period, it seems like land sales are still very robust. So we'll have to see where those are headed in the future, but as of right now, um, everything else, all else equal, if prices remain high, profitability looks good. We could still probably see some very, fairly robust land sales. The other question is, where's the cost of borrowing headed? Which that is up, uh, maybe up two, two and a half percent year over year right now, just because of the cost of borrowing is increasing with uh, Federal Reserve raising rates and some of those things. Uh, just to note in the chat pane, Ryan actually posted in there, if you want to take a look at our uh, land management quarterly, when we have them scheduled, recordings, upcoming outlines, that kind of thing. That can be found at um, first link. And then he also threw a link in there if you want to look at the farm real estate report. I, the report itself, we don't have all these charts put together that look real nice like this. What we do have is a breakdown by table, different types of land values, cash rents, things of that nature. All right, so briefly on cash rental rates. When we talk about cash rents, we start at the regional level. At the regional level here, what we see is overall cash rents for dry land cropland trended up across Nebraska. And in addition to the regional averages, we also have what is called 
the range or what we call HAL, HAL stands for the average of the high third, average of the low third, and overall, overall average for the region. And what we see here on the breakdown on these cash rents, uh, say for example here, overall average in Eastern Nebraska was 235 an acre. What is referred to as a high third is actually the upper third of cash rental rates for dry land cropland in 2022. And then the low third is 185. Now, if you're sitting there thinking about, okay, I just signed my lease six months ago, why do I care about cash rents? Well, the question you have to ask yourself is going into 2023, I know that I've even been asked, what are the cash rents going to be in 2024? Well, setting back for 2023, you have to at least ask yourself, where are we stacking up against some of these regional averages? How does my property compare to some of the cash rents that I have in my region based on the quality of land that my property is? So there's a lot of different things to consider, but uh, you got to ask yourself, if you want to know where you're going, you got to ask yourself, how do you stack up against some of the, the historic averages? Uh, the center pivot irrigated cropland rental rates for 2022. Uh, the breakout that we have here, this assumes that the landowner or the landlord owns the entire irrigation system. If they do not own a portion of the system, you would adjust the cash rents down to reflect the tenant providing some of those resources as part of the lease. And uh, the breakout that we have here on the cash rents, you know, in the Western Panhandle, we start out at 140 to 210. Northeast was the highest at 285 to 390. Southeast was from 345 to 265. And then the Southwest was 180 to 270. So depending on where you're at in the state, these cash rents can vary considerably. In addition to that, uh, the breakout, on cow-calf pair rental rates. So this assumes for one cow, one calf, for one month during the summer grazing season. The breakout that we have here ranges from below $40. So we're talking, uh, if this say for example was $40 a pair in the panhandle, take 40 times five, that would roughly be your cash rental rate for the grazing season. Um, so 40 times five would be roughly a little over 200 in this case. Uh, compared to the east here, you're closer to 60. 60 times 5 would roughly be 300. So what influences grazing land cash rents? Uh, quality of the fence. Who's upkeeping the fence? In addition to the upkeep on the property, who's dealing with uh, controlled noxious weeds, brushes, thistles, whatever the issue might be. And water sources. If you have a water source that's good year-round, there's a lot of issues in some of these farm, farm site or pasture rangeland site wells going dry this summer. The tenant's willing to haul water in. Who's covering some of these expenses? So there's a lot of different things that are piling into the cash rental rates. If you have a property that you wanted to rent for 150 days, but because of uh, the nature of the weather this past summer, say the cattle are only on the site for 120 days. If that's the case, you would discount the cash rent to reflect that. And when you discount the cash rent, you could take your uh, 150 day seasonal rent. And uh, you can maybe divide that by the number of grazing days and multiply it by the number that are actually grazed. Okay, just to provide a little more insight here, here we have a breakout of the agricultural statistic districts or what we call the crop reporting districts commonly. And some of the information that I'm gonna highlight here was gonna be summarized by region. So Take a moment here and ask yourself on the properties that you either own or manage or uh, work on or are affiliated with, where do these properties sit? And transition here to our topic on flexible cash leases with the breakout here on flexible cash leases. What we did here is we took a look. Uh, flexible cash leases are a way to take a cash rental rate and adjust that during the growing season according to some factor. And we do workshops, I've done webinars on flexible cash leases, but the main idea being we're trying to have a cash rental rate that is going to be reflective of some force, and that force being um, maybe crop price, crop yield, something of that nature, but we're trying to reflect the actual productivity or the price associated with the property. So in 2022, if you roll the clock back a year ago or maybe even eight months ago, 
uh, many people were dealing with higher input expenses. And with these higher input expenses, um, did we switch lease arrangements? Well, the switch in the lease arrangements, uh, about 8% of them switched to a crop share, about 23% clicks switched to what we call the flexible lease. Uh, the largest percent made no change and some even switched to cash rent. So that's how people are handling the higher input expenses here in 2022. And in addition to the higher input expenses, uh, another question that we had to ask is, in your area of the state, what's the most common type? What is the proportion of leases that you see? You see the line here is in blue. The lease type is a crop share. If the line is in red, it's a cash lease. And then the final thing is called a flex lease. And uh, with that being said, um, some of the trends, what I did was, so if you remember that prior slide, I said to take note where your property might be. Uh, here in the, we kind of grouped the state into the west, central, and east. What are the trends that you notice here? If you can see the top of this slide, you'll see that the gray area is roughly around 10% if you averaged it across the state. On average for the state, about 10% of the leases have some type of a cash lease with a flexible component. We tend to see uh, maybe more cash leases in predominantly row crop growing areas of the state especially like Northeast and East Nebraska. And then we tend to see a little bit more crop share here in the Panhandle or Southwest where we get into maybe a, it's a little more common to see a small grain such as wheat being raised. And it may be more risky in some of these areas with respect to rainfall or um, hail amount. So those were some of the trends. If you ever wondered if should I be on a cash lease, crop share or flex lease, this is a breakdown here on what we've seen in terms of the lease lease arrangement types across the state. If you are on a flex lease, what are people flexing cash leases on for crop land? Uh, majority of them are focusing on one of two things. About 37% are focusing on crop price. Uh, roughly 43% are focusing on what we call crop revenue. And then crop yield is the remaining 15%. But people, especially on irrigated, might be a little more concerned about um, what's the overall value of the crop if your yield history is pretty good. And then uh, they might focus a little bit more over on the overall crop revenue, which is a function of both yield, excuse me, yield and price. So that's the breakdown that we see right there. Um, and the other thing to note, if you are flexing a cash lease off a of price, meaning, okay, you have a cash rental rate. Cash rent may go up or down subject to a uh, change in the price. What price are people using? What is the price they use? And uh, overall majority use some type of local price, probably a local price average, or, or maybe they look at the average price of corn for every month and for every Friday, for example, in February, and maybe they compare it to every Friday in November or something like that. And uh, the other thing people focus on the crop insurance guarantees, which is basically a futures price. It's a 30 day planting and harvesting time price averages from the futures trade when the futures close. But uh, the futures price and the crop insurance, you know, they tend to dominate uh, another portion of that. And then there are some other regional prices here, but it appears the local cash price is one of the most popular alternatives. Okay, so what did we talk about just briefly? I said we'd cover in about the first 20 minutes, we'd highlight what's happening with currently on cash rental rates. And then we'd also highlight uh, some of the trends we're seeing in flexible cash leases. With this, we're gonna transition to our second portion of our presentation. And I think Alan will turn his camera on and I will mute mine and he'll just tell me to advance the slides. And thanks for letting me cover the first part. All right, so thank you very much, Jim, and uh, nice job with the numbers. And, and what's interesting is that as I look, Jim asked that question about flexible cash leasing probably seven or eight years ago. I'm not sure exactly when, but the, what you can look at those numbers and say is that the, the, the actual flex leasing in eastern, northeast Nebraska, eastern Nebraska is double. But uh, it doubled from like six or seven percent to about 13 to 15 percent. So it's not it's that's still not a great number, but it's, it, it's, it clearly has uh, increased and gone up. So I, I find that to be a very interesting thing. All right, I'm, I, I, okay, good. 
Control, okay, so there's some things we have to talk about in terms of land management issues. And one time, one thing I wanted to discuss is the late August into early September is a great time to be outstanding in your field. And I mean, that means you gotta be out there checking out what's happening in your field, especially as a landowner, time to get out there. And as a tenant, it's time to take your landowner out there if they're not going out themselves. I know that I went and drove down to my field last Saturday and I was um, disappointed to see if the corn is completely brown or nearly completely brown on top. It, it, it's just given up uh, because it just didn't have any water. It didn't get any rain. And uh, but, but secondly, I was pleased to note, however, that as I walked into the field, there was uh, ears, small, but they're there on virtually every plant. So um, it, but that's what you got to do. You got to go figure out where, you, where you're at. And so I don't expect a big yield. It's not going to be anywhere close to 100 bushels an acre. It might be lower, more like 50 or 60 bushels an acre, but at least there'll be some corn out there, I guess. We'll find out when we harvest, I guess. And so that's what I'm talking about being out there, outstanding in the field. You got to go see what's going on. It's, and as a landowner, that you, you really owe that to yourself to understand what happened this year with lack of rain, you're also looking for weed control, disease, insect pressure, disease pressure. Um, what happened with, if you if you would have had happened to have a big rain, uh, do you have to consider any different soil conservation practices? And if you have irrigation equipment, what equi what are the equipment needs out there? Do you have a do you have any uh, uh, sprinkler heads that need to be replaced? Do you have any gearboxes that need to be changed out? Talk to that tenant and figure out those things right now before they get to the end of the growing season because. Once we get harvest done and finished, people tend to forget, number one, to go look, and number two, to go have that conversation about what needs to be done for next year. And it's, it's just look right now and take notes and know what's going on. Okay, ready. Next slide. Okay. So you're going to look at, you're going to, uh, I don't think there are any wet spots to worry about this year, but you're going to look for any uneven plant stands. You're going to look for weed issues. You're going to look for disease and insect pressure. You look at where your maturity's at, because I mean, I know I looked at my cornfield, and quite honestly, I'll be shocked if he's not harvesting at Labor Day or just soon after Labor Day because it's just that far along already. Uh, and then on forage land, you're going to look at the height and condition of the plants, overall weed pressure. If you see if you have any noxious weeds or brush, and when I'm talking about brush, in eastern Nebraska, our biggest problem is cedar trees, not really brush, but and it can be brush too in certain instances, but mostly the time cedar trees. Well, you need to go check that out. See where you're at with some of your cedars and stuff too. It's just an important thing to do. Just know where you're at with what's, 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 what's going on to those things. So uh, it's a good time to get that all checked out. It's a good time to visit with your tenant about those things. It's a good time to have a negotiation or a to visit about who's going to do what, who's in charge of what, and what that's going to look like in terms of expense or compensation. All right, go ahead. Um. So we're Jim and I have worked. I mean, I've worked on this land management thing for about 15 years now, and and I know that Jim's been on this thing ever since he took started in with the extension here seven eight years ago, nine years ago maybe now. The point point is one thing we keep uh, talking about all the time is the need to get rid of verbal or handshake agreements and get them switched over to written agreements. And so if you have a verbal or handshake agreement for farm ground farmland. Um, you have to understand that um, to end that lease for the 23 year and get to a written agreement, that notification has to be given prior to September 1st uh, in two weeks. Okay, you have to get that. You have to get that done here in the next two weeks, if possible, or if, or 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 the tenant could just choose to have the ground for another whole year. Notification has to be given prior to six months, and. Um, the cropland leases require a six-month termination notice, so otherwise they automatically renew. Pasture leases are typically five months. So because the lease ends, usually around November 1st or October 1st, November 1st, somewhere between there, that lease is over. So there, you have to start a new lease every year, basically, unless you have a, a written contract that says that, you know, that, you're gonna, that it's going for so many years for five months each year. Then you then your your lease can continue because you that's what you've written in the contract. But without a written lease, the pasture lease ends, and so that trip, that termination notice isn't necessarily applicable to pastures. Um, the Supreme Court has not at least at least has not determined that or or, or ruled on that. The interesting thing, however, um, 
so there you go. The interesting there, it's interesting thing there is, is that you just have to know the difference and be willing to visit with people about that difference. Okay. All right. Let's go on. Um, so be sure you have a written lease because they have a higher value because it protects the rights of both parties. Specific duties are uh, written out for both parties and they're spelled out in the lease. Here's the, here's the deal. I mean, I run into uh, my, my generation and older people that uh, will say, I don't, you know, I don't need a written lease. In our, in our generation, our word is our bond. And we shook hands and that meant something. I get that. And I, I'm, I'm kind of in that generation too. I understand that my handshake is worth everything. But you still need to have it written down. The reason you have to have a written lease is because what happens when I'm gone? What happens when my tenant's gone, if I'm a landowner? What happens if my landowner's gone, if I'm a tenant? Unless you have that all written down, especially these things about what the specific duties and rights are that we have on the slide here, then that can be lost when one of the parties is gone or it, it becomes suspicious when another party interprets something differently but the, other than what you had understood with the previous, uh, let's say that I'm a tenant. Now my landowner passes away and his children take over the lease. And now all of a sudden, they're wanting to change things or, or, or ask questions or question my work that I've been out there doing for 40 years on that lease ground. Uh, that, that just creates a lot of uncomfortableness. And so make sure that you uh, think about that and get stuff written down before we have those changes in generations. Um, documents, lease terms for unforeseen events. Okay, uh, absentee third policy, policy may not have current knowledge and experience. I, I just described that. Okay, so we can go on, next slide. So it's, it's also a great time just to look at leases and, and thinking about what we're doing with conservation practices and who's going to pay what, thinking about non-crop weed, weed control, uh, timing of the lease payment, uh, when, when is that payment going to, when are those payments going to be made if there's more than one, and when, when is one payment going to be made, or when is there two payments going to be made, uh, and, in, and in when is your lease termination notice uh, due date. Even for written leases, you probably still want a lease termination notice in there, and sometime in the fall, early fall is a good time to do it. I think the six month thing works pretty well because mostly because in the fall, farmers have the discount or the tenants have the ability to get discounts on their fertilizer and their, and their seed and their fuel and those kind of inputs for the next year. And so a lot of them will pay cash up ahead of time to try and, and you know, get past that, get, get those discounts. And so if you don't have your, if you're going to pull your land on them, uh, make sure they give them enough notice that they don't buy inputs for your land that they're not going to need. That would, that's just, a, that just creates a bad, you know, bad taste. Um, time of lease payment, uh, when is your lease termination? I'll say, look over all the provisions and make sure it's in your good shape. It's a good time to review the lease. And so please do that and, and even talk to, sit down between both parties and, and have that discussion. Okay, next slide. Um, I think that the lease should be renegotiated basically at the same time every year. And I think it just avoids confusion and, and so, Here's what I've run into. I've had have had landowners. I've had landowners want to know that the price of price of commodities are going up. So when they want to when do they want to over time and when do they want to renegotiate the lease? Well, right before March first when it starts. I've had tenants know that the price is going down over time. So when they want to rene renegotiate the lease, right before March first. And when does the landlord want to renegotiate that lease? Right here, right now in August. So um, set a time where you're going to renegotiate the lease. You don't have to play the games of whether the prices are going up or down. That's an important time. to. It's an important thing to consider. But I'm just recommending that you set one time. That's when you can renegotiate. I mean, I talked with one couple once here about 10 years ago now. said, we renegotiate in November. I said, why do you do that? Because he said at Thanksgiving. They said, we do this now because of Thanksgiving, we leave for Arizona for the winter. And we don't get back until after March 1st. We get back usually around April 1st. And so this way it's done before we leave and it's done before that lease starts. And I thought, good for you. At least you have a time specified and all, it's all set up. That, that's all, that part's very good. Um, so I'm not, I don't have a recommendation on when that should be. I'm just saying that um, just set up good communication, gets us all taken care of and uh, kind of know ahead of time what's going to happen. Okay, next slide. Now, I think there's already a question about this. So I'm glad to get to answer it ahead of time. If you don't have a written lease, you're going to get to a written lease. You're going to terminate the, the, the verbal or handshake agreement. You're going to get to a written lease. A good place to start from is aglease101.org. That's a website. And they have free fill-in-the-blank PDF leases. 
And if you and if you uh, so you have lease lease publications there, if you click on the the document library, you've got lease publications on one side, but more importantly, on the other side, on the right hand side, you got the cash farm lease form, a crop share lease form, pasture lease form, building farm building lease form, all that sort of thing. <coughs> and you can you can um, just download those leases. If you have if your computer's got the PDF for, uh, Adobe on it, you can just fill in the blank right there. It works out pretty well. So we say it's a great place to start from. Actually, they're very complete, and you may not even use all the blanks, but you have the ability to do that. Jim, what do you want to add? No, there was a question yeah. on a lease uh, template for a lease, and this is the place we direct people to. It's a great resource. This is it. Yeah, that's what I was. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. This is it. Okay, let's go on. Okay. Oh. Now we're okay. going to first session. Okay, so if you have any questions, um, it looks like we had one question or one yeah, one question that came in about um, are there any lease form templates? And Alan answered that through aglease101.org. And also check with a local attorney in a rural town. A lot of them have different forms on file for a, a fairly nominal cost. You can get a form that way if you like. Um, the other question, since we have fairly limited ones, we have several prepared, but we might as well just answer this one since we only have one. Well, there's one here um, on cost of removing yeah. seeds. So let's get to that later. You want to do it later? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you want me to talk about it right now? Uh, all right. So the question is, do we have any companies and what is the typical cost of removing cedar trees on the land? Why don't you go ahead and answer that, Alan, then I'll add to well, it. Well, yeah, you may add something to this. I mean, I don't have any companies that we recommend. I, I'm sure there are companies out there. I know of an individual in South Central Nebraska that does that sort of thing around Beaver City, but but uh, I don't know of any specific companies that do that. I, you know, I do know that it can be rather quite expensive. And here's what I recommend on cedar trees. You got through cedar trees, you got to be at three foot or less. Three foot is your key number. If you can cut them and get them down at three foot or less, it's going to be a lot less expensive, either chemically or mechanically, than it is if you wait until you get to eight or 10, 12 foot tall. But I had we had I had a farmer once that I was visiting with that had had cedar trees and locusts, thorny locusts in his pasture here in southeast Nebraska, and he he flat had to pay a hundred bucks an acre to get that all that pasture cleaned up. <clears throat> and the the bottom line is, um, he was never probably never going to get a hundred dollars an acre out of that pasture in terms of increased grazing and that sort of thing. So let's let's control that before it gets out of control. That's just silly. That's all. Uh, my comment, if you get if you're trying to find someone that does this type of work, sometimes local natural resource conservation service NRCS offices might have some names. They aren't going to recommend anyone, but they might have some local names. Sometimes with some of their properties, you have to get some of that type of work done and they have they know of people in the area. Uh, possibly the local natural resource district might know as well. And uh, the other comment I'd make is, they, Alan's exactly right. It depends. If you have three foot or less, it doesn't take too much to have these things in skid steers to either clip them off or shred them. The bigger they are, the more it costs. Sometimes people bid it by the property. Sometimes they do it by the hour. Just completely depends on what type of rig you have. Okay. I know there's okay, well, more one more thing to throw in there, though. The other thing to throw in there is just simply say trees are a landowner issue, in my view, although I don't have a database that says that's absolutely true. And to be true, Jim, tell them what you say about cedar cedar tree control, because you're probably more right than I am. So when it comes to controlling the cedar trees, uh, there was a question asked, is cedar trees an issue in eastern Nebraska problem or everywhere? Uh, you know, in north central eastern Nebraska, and if they're not a problem in an area, you probably have some other type of weed or a brush or something that's an issue. If you have a property that has a lot of issues when it comes to that, um, can you come up with a management plan with the tenant to subdivide the property and okay, each year you're going to do a quarter of the site. Uh, if you are renting a property that's been well maintained, I would see that maybe could be something the tenant is part of the lease. You want them to control those things. That's something that could be negotiated. If you have something that looks like a forest to begin with, and it's going to take a lot of time. Can you negotiate that into the lease that you're going to discount the cash rent maybe significantly to allow for that tenant to um, go out there and do some of the work. Uh, depending on what type of tree it is, if it's a, like a volunteer cottonwood tree, maybe cattle will eat the leaves off the cottonwood tree. If it's a thorny locust or whatever I'll call it, they aren't probably gonna wanna touch that very much. So 
having cattle present on the site can help with control of some of these different types of brush or trees, but it just depends on the species. So, um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started on these questions here. I think I got two questions kind of, I'll have two questions and then we'll sum everything together by answering some of these additional ones that will come in. So the first question, how should you figure out a, ca a flexible cash lease? Uh, what's the very basics? I could spend an hour talking on this. Just know if you do, a, in my view, a flexible cash lease is when you allow cash rent to just not go up, but also go down based on some factor of risk. That risk might be a crop price, yield, combination of the two. If you do a flexible cash lease, in my view, you need to have a range. What I mean by that is if your base cash Trends 220 an acre, there needs to be a maximum. Maybe it's 240, maybe it's 260. I don't care what it is, but you have to have a minimum and a maximum to account for the fact that if some unknown factor occurs, uh, remember, if you have unlimited downside potential, the property is an absolute disaster. Most farmers, most operators are probably still going to have crop insurance to cover a fair amount of their financial risk. And just because you have unlimited price, um, you know, there's a big spread right now between the old crop corn price and the new crop corn price. So that's why you got to have a differential in there to account for that. And uh, here's an example here. And if you really are interested in this, uh, I would suggest finding these slides online. The best place is that website. The fastest place to find it is a website. Ryan said these slides and the recording will be posted tomorrow. Left-hand side, we have a case here. Um, you know, the prices end up higher. Right hand side, we have a case where prices end up lower. Based on those price changes, we actually adjust the cash rent to account for that. So that's some of the breakdown that we see right there. And um, I'm not going to go through all the numbers. Just know if you get a piece of paper out and work through them, I have confidence that, that you would either add on some to the cash rent as long as it's less than 240. And let's say this flex should be 297 an acre. Well, if the top end of the cash rent ends at 240, you don't allow it to go any higher. And this exa other example here, the flexible cash lease, as long as it's greater than 200, you're going to pay that amount, you're going to discount the cash rent. And if it ended up at, say, 150, the minimum from the prior example was 200 an acre. Okay. Uh, Al, I'll let you address this question. I think the next two or three slides are kind of yours. There we, go. there we go, I got it unmuted now. So I wanted to make one more comment about cedar trees. They asked where we have cedar trees. Yes, in Eastern Nebraska, all the way up and down the Missouri River. And we go out almost to half, halfway through the state before you see a really a drop in cedar trees. And cedar trees will even follow the loop valleys up quite a ways. And in Southwest Nebraska, it can be full of cedar trees. The only place you don't have cedar trees is deep in the heart of the sand hills and in the panhandle. You don't see very many out there. Uh, so uh, anyway, there's a, but, but out there you have, out in the panhandle, you have Russian olive, and in the, pan, in the, in the sand hills, you got uh, small soapweed and the yucca plants are small soapweeds. So you, you've always got an issue. It just depends on what part of the state you're in. Okay, so if I'm going to terminate my lease, a verbal or handshake agreement, I need to send my tenant, I, or my tenant needs to send me, or I need to send my tenant typically, a termination letter. What does it have to say? We don't provide a template for that because the university has told us we should not get into any legal uh, entanglements. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be pro providing legal help or legal services. The bottom line is you need to say, this is my date. This is when I'm sending the letter. This is my date in the letter. You just say who you are and who the tenant is. Um, you need to talk about where the property is at, or, the, or, or at least a brief legal description so it's very clear in a court of law that that's the property you're talking about. And say that we're terminating the lease as of uh, February 28th, 2023. That's the end of the term. That's the end of that farmland year. And then, um, if you want to, and then of course, if you want, if you're going to keep the same tenant and just go to a written lease, which is you know many times what happens, you say <coughs> we're very interested in having you continue on as a tenant, but we're going to have a written lease starting March 1st, 23. Let's talk about over that. The, let's get that set up over the next few months. So that's what you need to do to make that all pull, pull to come together. And then uh, <clears throat> you consider call it, uh, consulting an attorney 
who can send out the termination letter for a nominal fee. They're not, they're not that hard and they're not that long. They just don't take that long. Oh, the other thing I don't have is a bullet point in this slide that I should is that, is that if there's a, you need to also probably say, if you have any personal property on the, on the, if you have any of your own personal property on my property, then please remove it by February 28th, 2023. Please remove all your property by then. So that's important. Um, and can you, in a certified mail with re return receipt, that's important because then you get a signature from the receiver that he has received that letter. If he doesn't open it, that's his problem, but at least he received it. So that's, that's what you have to kind of uh, cover in a letter like that. Uh, oh, okay, so if you plan on selling the ground, do I need to let the tenant know that um, the lease may or may not happen? Okay, so if it's a written lease, if it's a written lease, okay, or, or a verbal lease for as that goes, um, it depends on when the lease is supposed to end or when the lease does end, because quite honestly, I, if I <coughs> have a lease in effect right now, I could sell my ground right now, and my tenant would still have the right to farm that farm ground for as long as that lease is in effect. Does that make sense? If you have a three-year lease and you sell the ground now, and there's two years left on a three-year lease, the tenant gets to, to farm it all three years. There, that, that tenant, that lease just goes with the land, okay? Now, that's why you need to get all these verbal leases ended. So if you have that kind of situation coming up, that you can you can uh, have it on a written lease and, uh, you know, and maybe you put a clause in a written lease saying, hey, if we're still on the ground, we'll give you a first right of refusal or first chance to buy it. But we, but we're gonna, we're gonna terminate the lease at that time. You can put that into a lease as long as the tenant agrees to it. That you could do that. So there you go. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else with that, Jim. I, that's my thought on that. Anyway. No, just remember. Sometimes people ask us. We do a one year, three year, five year. We've had people ask about ten year leases. Whatever lease terms you agree to, a, a sudden change of ownership had a change. Whatever the terms of those leases are, will carry forward even if the future landowner wants to farm it themselves. So just remember the what other thing, the other thing to say about that is you could set up a longer term lease, and it happens. It happens often, actually. If you're if if the land, excuse me, if the tenants make an investment in the property in terms of some of the land uh, land improvements, uh, building terraces, that sort of thing, or if they're making investments in a property in terms of irrigation equipment. Uh, then it, that'll happen. And so that's fine. But you just have to understand then that um, you're going to give them a three-year lease or a five-year lease or whatever because they made these extra investments. But maybe you still retain the right to, to renegotiate the lease uh, at a certain time every year to, reach, to change that price because the yes. prices have been so variable lately. Uh, Alan and I are not advocating against long-term lease arrangements in terms of dealing with people. What we do advocate for is cash rental rates or even crop share provisions need to be renegotiated annually because and we don't even know what the price of corn is going to be in two months yet alone two years or 10 years from now or whatever the period of time is. I um, wanted to highlight a few other things. We will come back to this slide just in a moment, but I know as time goes on here, people might start dropping off a little bit. Like, once again, I want to thank uh, Hertz Farm and Ranch Management. Uh, they do a great job doing what they do. If you need any type of management, real estate sales, appraisals, I know they do have an appraiser on staff in Omaha that travels to greater state in Nebraska. Be sure to reach out to them. And once again, Scott and David, uh, thanks for helping out with this meeting today. If you would like to help us with some of our real estate um, efforts that we have here going on at the university, uh, please consider visiting with the NU Foundation. Uh, Barbara over there helps us out. There's a little website link where you can actually just log on to and make a donation via credit, check, whatever. Uh, all your donations, they don't, the only thing they go into is helping deal with the cost of printing and mailing out our surveys. So if you like some of these numbers you've seen or you find them valuable, uh, anything will help us out in the future with this. And uh, finally, uh, we have kind of our last uh, late summer in-person meetings associated with some of our landlord tenant cash rent meetings. The current three that we have on the docket are called, so you've inherited a farm, so now what? Uh, we have two coming up, one in Grand Island and the other in Auburn. 
And then we'll have one in September 1 at Round the Bend Steakhouse. And uh, each one of these are being sponsored by a people's company. And they also include a free meal. And I'm sure all of them will have uh, really good food. I know, obviously, tomorrow, if you unless you're living in Grand Island, I think they have around 30 people registered. But please call ahead. Got to make sure we have enough handouts as well as enough food for the meetings. I don't want people showing up and we don't have enough handouts to go around. So I think we'll be sitting okay with handouts right now. But uh, if you would like to come, just call the local county extension office where the uh, meetings are going to be located. And then the final thing, uh, on November 14th, we'll have our final land management quarterly of 2022. And we'll have a breakdown here. Uh, take a look at 2022 county level cash rents that come from the USDA that get published here in about a month and a half. And Alan will be taking a look at some of these things when we, he calls it closing out the lease, things to be thinking about for 2023. Okay. Um, we're going to go so back. There was one question that came way right early, Jim, and it talked about uh, how do I determine a lease rate for my farm? Uh, you want to visit? You want to visit with them about that a little bit? Yeah, come to our meeting. Uh, this September first meeting is part of our outreach right now. Our traditional three three and a half hour program. There's a portion where if I go through the whole cash rents, we started step down to the county. And then I talk about some farm level cash rent examples. And with those farm level cash rent examples, we calculate how do you figure out a cash rent? Uh, what we do is we do some different ways of estimating cash rent to ask ourselves a question. Uh, how do you adjust that regional information? Where if you were going to want to cash rent, how do you take a crop share and make it into a cash rent? The information the University of Nebraska, the USDA publishes, these are estimates. If you get offered an amount, maybe it's more, maybe it's less than the regional cash rent. First question I ask myself is why is it maybe your property isn't quite as good as what the regional or county is or vice versa? Um, you know, ask yourself, what is the opportunity value on my land if I wasn't on a crop share, it'd be cash rent. Crop shares are equitable. They reflect the true cost and the income associated with property. The opportunity value on a crop share would be a cash rent. That's another way to take a look at it. So there's no one formula I can just give you and it's going to figure it out for you, but we can give you some ideas in that September 1st meeting will be uh, recorded and we plan to archive it. So you can definitely um, go online and watch that. Or and if you don't have a computer, check out a local public library and even some of the uh, extension offices across the state of Nebraska. If you don't have a computer or do the technology thing, I know some of them have a facility where they can set up a webinar and you can watch it at your leisure if you get an appointment. There's a, there's a, there's a, and that's, that would be correct for um, the one person that just, uh, Kim says, Kim said, I'm in Denver. Yeah, watch the archive. It'll be up there by the third week or third or fourth week of September. So just watch for that or email one of us and we'll make sure you get it, uh, get the link for that. There's another comment in here that said, in, in some cases, the counties do their own cash rent survey work and they have it at the county level, and they know that uh, that, uh, that Aaron does it in Custer County. Uh, that's not the right first name. Troy, uh, Troy, Troy does it at Custer County, and I think that so does Lancaster. So so does uh, Lexington. So does Dawson County. And I mean, there may be other Jim. You can comment on that. Uh, there are a, a select group of extension educators, or you might be more familiar with the extension agents back in the day. Uh, yes. Dawson County, um, Sarah Civis does a survey. Um, Broken Bow with Troy Walls does a survey and Randy Sainer out of North Platte. And they kind of do that for their limited areas in which they primarily provide service. But the, yeah, they're definitely another source of information. The survey is an opinion about, and I will tell people, these will give you some ideas. If we didn't have these ideas, what do you have to go off of? If you're searching for cash rent information, and you graduated from some little town somewhere in Nebraska, but now you live in Denver, contact your, you know, maybe you know some of the ag bankers in that little town. Maybe you know uh, some crop insurance agents. Just start asking around, talking to people, getting a sense on a feel of what is happening in the area. Um, the, thing, the other thing to note but, is that, I'm sorry, Jim, when you finish up. No, no, I said go ahead. Okay. So the other thing to note is that I think there's some survey bias based on who's doing the survey, and Jim doesn't ever talk about this, but I just throw quick in there that his survey is done by ag professionals 
uh, real estate people, farm managers, the, the whole professional group. And then there's a USDA survey, which Jim, Jim did not show this time because we showed it earlier. Uh, and, it, and quite honestly, it comes out the second week of September. So that if that's available this year, we'll show it in November at uh, the November quarterly meeting that's filled out that that survey is done by farmers. So if you got if you got ag professionals on one hand versus farmers on the other hand, uh, what can you expect from the survey results? I know what I can expect. I can expect the farmers to to report a lower number and the ag professionals to report maybe a little bit higher number. And I'm, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm just that's kind of what I've observed over these years that I'm doing this education. So all it does is give you a place to start from. It doesn't tell you what your rent should be. And I think we do a pretty good job in maintaining the integrity of the survey. By I go through each one of the surveys that come in each year. As I said before, they're estimates, right? What your property is, what it produces, what the water supply is, if it's irrigated, if it's grazing land, is it a sub-irrigated meadow? Is it the side of a large, very large sand hill? I mean, whatever, there's a lot of unique things. And that's why some of those examples I deliver in my presentation, take a look at how do you calculate that cash rent? So, okay, any other questions? I think we're actually on time for the first time that we've done this in a while, Al. We're at 1250. I'm just, uh, keep an eye on the chat there. Ryan Evans typed in some uh, for the farm inheritance land management workshops. He's got a little link there. Actually, you know what, I'm gonna go I'm going to go to right that. There. If you so, uh, so Jim, know that we're talk, calling those landlord tenant cash rents meetings, and that's true. But know that their official title is so you inherited a farm. So now what? It's especially made. These are especially designed for people that are have to manage farm ground or know that they will be managing farm ground, and even people that have had it for a while that want to kind of get a refresher course. It's kind of a ag management 101 type of thing. So maybe make sure you attend if you'd like to, or watch that September 1st uh, archive um that we when we get it posted that'll be recorded yeah and uh if you don't have time or you can't scribble down all the details to where these meetings are write down the number and just call the local office manager for the extension office will uh can provide you with some great insight all right the I cool think thing I... is we got we got we're going to do them for free we got the we got yep. we got uh, we got the handouts we got the handouts printed to some money we've had on hand and and uh, we have the Jim's got the sponsor for the meal. So we're doing these meetings for free. You don't get anything better than that deal. Oh, as I tell Al, free, the word free is a four lettered F word. We have the cost covered through different sources this time. And we're very thankful for the people that are willing to help us out, including the local county offices that are helping host these things. It takes a lot of time to get these things together. So uh, with that, Al, I don't see any other questions here. Uh, appreciate everyone that logged on. And um, if you're interested in helping us out, you can call Barbara too. She can get you set up with whatever. But um, yeah, we had a great group on again today. I had fun. And uh, I think I, I seen one little place I need on that one slide that I call it landlord tenant cash rent meetings. That's just a slide I continually update the meetings as we're getting new ones on schedule. But Alan is corrected. It's kind of a like a primer to farm succession transition, whether you look to inherit it something or you have something to give to someone. And it's just a really good, it's one of our more popular programs we've done. Over and years. Quite honestly, yeah, I do I do, do about a 20 minute segment in there on, on succession planning. So it's a nice meeting to get to. It's nice information to have. Thanks for everybody for being on. We appreciate it. All right, with that, I think, unless there's anything else, I'm not seeing anything on my end. So I think we'll just go ahead and, sign off at this point and uh, Alan gives us a thumbs up. So uh, if you want to visit, be sure to reach out to us. Okay. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop my share. And uh, Brian, I think he'll probably kill the recording here just in a moment, but uh, thanks everyone for joining.